Thank you, Lord. Men, if your wife is here, give her a kiss and you may be seated. I'm going to tell y'all that I don't know what's up at eight in the morning. I don't know because they wake up early or what. Those, those are the most romantic men in the entire church. I mean, when I'd say, I'll, I'll barely say like, but on this, and they're already kissing their wives. I'm like, calm down, we're in church. But you know, love is in the air at 8 a.m. I can tell you that much. I can tell you that much. I'm going to ask you to open up your Bible to three sections of the Bible. We're going to start off this afternoon in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And then we're going to pass to 2 John, I mean, uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John is not the same as the Gospel of St. John. 1 John is closer to Revelations toward the end of the Bible. So we've got 1 Corinthians 13, 1 John chapter 2. And then we're, and we'll be in that area for a bit. Then we're going to finish off in 2 Peter chapter 3. And that's where we'll finish today. 2 Peter chapter 3. Before we get started, I do want to say Feliz Año Nuevo. Happy New Year. Still early in the year. So happy New Year. Um, on behalf of La Iglesia del Pueblo and Pueblos Church, we wish you and your family the best in 2021. Uh, a year filled with prosperity, uh, with blessings, with peace, and with good health. Amen? Amen. Amen. Last week, those of you who came, you know, we, we uh, touched the question of what is happening. We looked around the world today, what's going on, and we talked about, about the end times. And today I'm going to continue on that teaching, just that um, I hope to end by the end of my teaching, not the question of what is happening, but who is coming, right? Who is coming? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 reads, Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Verse 10. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. Verse 12. When I was a... Uh, verse 12. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Let's go back to verse 9. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Prophecy, I believe um, that today there are people that move in the prophetic. Um, uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit still gives people prophetic word, but one of the things we must understand, whether we're talking about someone with a prophetic word or as we've been looking at, looking at scripture and as we'll see today, looking at prophecies of the end times, is what this last part in verse 9 says. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only a part of the whole picture. When we talk about prophecy, we're seeing a part of the whole picture. Kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. I don't know about you guys, but when I work a jigsaw puzzle, I like to work all the edges, right? And all the edges kind of give me an idea of what the picture is going to look like, but it's not the complete picture. It's like looking at a painting and prophecy is like looking at a corner of that painting or maybe just looking at a side or a certain section. And uh, so uh, last week I talked about uh, the tribulation, the rapture, uh, a little bit about the millennium. And, and I explained last year, uh, last, last year, last week, so, man, I'm way off, right? Uh, last week, that there's three main um, beliefs when it comes to interpreting uh, the rapture. I tell you that every year um, at your school, Pueblo's Royal Christian School, shameless plug, we're currently um, registering pre-K to eighth grade. Um, but anyways, um, at uh, your school, Pueblo's Royal Christian School, every year, pretty much, uh, students, they reach a certain point where they're in their schoolwork, come and interview me, and we talk about the tribulation. And I like to get this study Bible that I bought uh, probably over 20 years ago, Spirit-Filled Bible. I don't know if it's still in print, but I like to bring that Bible. And I like to show them, like toward the end of this study Bible, there's a section dedicated, and it's probably like 25 or more pages. Um, in one service, I said 50. That might be an exaggeration, but it's at least 25 or more, you know, pastor speaking hyperbole. And um, talking about the tribulation. And, and I mentioned last week that some people believe, like myself included, I said we believe, I should say I believe, that Jesus will return 
and, and rapture the church, take the church up before the seven years of tribulation. Some people believe that there will be three and a half years of tribulation. Jesus will return for the church and then the world will experience three and a half more years of tribulation, worse than the first half. Three and a half plus three and a half is seven, if you're doing the math. And then there's some that believe that there will be seven years of tribulation and um, Jesus somehow will keep and protect the church the way God protected Noah and his family during the flood. And so the church will get to see seven years of tribulation, but not experience tribulation. I'll tell you that um, about Tuesday, um, I think it was about Monday or Tuesday of uh, last week after teaching um, about the tribulation, a little bit about tribulation, my father calls me and he says, son, he's like, I just want you to know that I believe in um, three and a half years of tribulation, then Jesus will return and then we'll go, you know, there'll be three and a half years of worse tribulation. And I had said that I believed that Jesus would return um, before the tribulation. And I told him, well, all I can say is we shall see, yeah. right? Because there are two rules that you and I need to understand when it comes to prophecy and especially when it comes to end time prophecies. We see part of the picture. No one knows exactly how it will happen. No one knows exactly how it will occur. And it cracks me up when I hear pastors and ministers and people debate these things like they know for sure. No, no one knows for sure. And I'll give you a great example, and I, I might have mentioned this last week. There's a prophecy in the book of Revelation about these two witnesses that they will kill and the world will see this and rejoice and they won't bury them. They'll leave their bodies out in the open. The world will see them and rejoice and then they will resurrect, you know. Uh, 2,000 years ago when John writes that, people are like, that's crazy. How's the world, entire world going to see these two bodies? Right? A thousand years ago they said that. A hundred years ago, they're like, that's crazy talk, right? As a matter of fact, 50 years ago, people would have been like, that's crazy talk. How's the entire world going to see these two dead bodies and then see them resurrect? But today... Any one of us can go live on any format of social media and the entire world can see what is happening wherever we're at. And so now we see the technology and we see, hey, it's total possible. Total, it's a total possibility. Now, I do want to share this. I don't think that God was waiting on any technology. If uh, this would have happened 2,000 years ago, I think God is powerful enough, capable enough that he could have put the image in every human's mind and we would have been able to see it. So God's not waiting on any technology, but I just want to say the way we interpret it today is way different than how we interpret it even 50 years ago. And look, look at the mark of the beast. You know, we, I, when I was a kid, they used to teach us it was like this tattoo, right? Now we know more about computer chips and, and stuff like that. So we know only in part, all right? So one, no one knows exactly how things will happen. And two, no one knows the hour. No one knows the hour. In 1988, this man wrote a book, and it was 88 reasons of why Jesus would return, and I believe he picked the month of September, September 8th of 1988, and it didn't happen. In the 90s, I believe it was, there was a famous series of books that made her movies, the Left Behind series, and people thought like, oh, man, it's going to happen now in the 90s, and it didn't happen. And uh, just recently, maybe about four years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a minister, I believe a very sincere man, a lot of knowledge of scripture, a lot of knowledge of the end times. And he came out in national news that he had predicted like, hey, this is the day Jesus was going to return this day. And it didn't happen. And shortly after he, he passed away. And um, I believe that he saw something. He saw it in prophecy. He saw it in part. And Jesus himself says that it's an unexpected hour. That means that people won't even expect it. When it happens, we'll be like, man, I never thought it was going to be at that moment. So no one knows exactly how. No one knows exactly when. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. And already many such antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last, last hour has come. So we are now in the last hours, right? And John writes this 2,000 years ago. So 2,000 years ago, we entered into the last hours or the, the final days, the, the last times, however you want to call it. And we see two categories. We see the antichrist is coming. And then we see another category. And this category says 
already many such antichrist, plural, have appeared. So there is an antichrist that is coming, and then there are antichrists, plural, that appear, that exist. Let's go to chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God, such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. So now we have a third category. First category, the Antichrist. Second category, many Antichrists. Third category, the spirit of the Antichrist, all right? And we see these moving, and I'll explain a little bit more. We see these moving in um, Hollywood, news, entertainment, industry, the educational system, and government, all right? And I'll give a brief example of some of this, all right? What is Antichrist? So I looked up, like, what is Antichrist? Looked it up in a Bible dictionary, and, and, it, and it is, it said, the adversary of the Messiah, all right? So when we say Jesus Christ or Christ, Christ is the Greek word for, in Hebrew, Messiah, which means the anointed one. And so the Antichrist is the adversary, the, the enemy of the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. I'm going to take you all back to English Grammar 101. Prefix, all right? Y'all remember prefixes? And a prefix here is anti, all right? Antichrist. What does anti mean? Anti means against, opposite, or contrary, all right? Against, opposite, or contrary to Christ, the Messiah, to Jesus. So rather it's against, contrary, or opposite of Jesus and his teachings, or the Word of God, or how sometimes we'll describe the Word of God, biblical principles. Let's read 2 John, so it's just a page or two, 2 John, verse 7. 2 John only has one chapter, verse 7. I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. How do we see the spirit of the Antichrist move in Hollywood? Well, if you look at a movie or a show today, very rarely will you see a happily married, married couple, one man and one woman. You will see more than likely a homosexual couple. Um, you will see a couple that has relations, sexual relations, but are not married. If there is a married couple, one is cheating on the other. And if it is a normal married couple, no one's cheating on one another. For some reason, they always paint the man, the head of the house, like a clown. Like he's this goofball. He doesn't know anything. His kids are smarter. The wife is smarter. Everybody's smarter than this clown. And everybody's got to do stuff for this guy that's just kind of out there. Right? So we see that Hollywood paints a picture that is very much against biblical teaching of what marriage is between one man and one woman, right? Uh, we, we see these things in, um, in, in, in the entertainment industry, um, which, is, which is connected to Hollywood. We see this going on in schools, universities. Many people here who went to the university, and um, there are certain topics you could not write about in English class, right? You better not write against abortion or right, that you believe in, in traditional marriage, right? As Genesis teaches, a, a man will leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, right? You, you can't write about those things, you can't talk about those things. And uh, you got social media, you can't even post about those things, right? You can get in trouble. Um, I was there, I don't remember how many years ago now, it's probably like four years ago where several pastors and Religious leaders, we were in downtown Houston, City Hall, protesting against Mayor Anise Parker and the city council. They wanted to pass this law, this rule where um, men could enter into the women's bathrooms. Some of you guys, anybody remember what I'm talking about, right? You know, as long as a man said I identify as a woman, should have the right to enter into a woman's bathroom. I was there for that. And, and, and we see this movement in government, right? Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk about for or against 
any president, but in the first few days of the new administration, sign of a pen. Schools, public schools and federal buildings, if there's a man that identifies as a woman, he must be, or the ch student must be allowed to go into the women's bathroom, women's locker room, or even participate in girls' sports, right? So a boy feels like, hey, I'm a girl, and therefore I should participate in soccer with the girls, volleyball with the girls, basketball with the girls, and score 100 points on them every game, <laughs> right? You know, because just basic biology, the dense, bone density and muscle density of a boy is very different than a girl. But, and uh, so this is very anti what the Bible teaches. God created man and woman, right? Well, you guys see this, and especially the younger generation, they, 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 for them, this is what they're growing up in. How will we recognize the Antichrist, Antichrist, and spirit of the Antichrist. So whatever is opposite against or contrary, Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and biblical principles. So I want to share with you, before I answer the question of who is coming, because we see one of the persons that's coming that's already here, the spirit's already here, is the Antichrist. I want to share with you some of the excuses that the world is going to use to attack the church. And when I say the church, I mean the church in general. Un, you will hear more and more the term hate speech. All right. Hate speech. Most of you are my age and younger, so you're already hearing about hate speech. Right. So um, we believe Ephesians teaches that the man is the head of the household. It says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Uh, husband, before you elbow your wife, I do want to say this, be a husband that is worthy of submission, Amen. right? Uh, the husband should be the head of the house, the leader of the house, be a husband who is worthy of being the leader of the house, all right? But that's sexist. You see, you hate on women, Pastor Ruben, you, you're trying to push them down and exalt men, you patriarchs, and, right? And so that's sexist, right? Hate speech. You guys there at Pueblo's Church, you are so intolerant. You're intolerant against the LGBTQ plus community. You're intolerant against those who support abortion. You're intolerant against those poor boys who feel like a girl. You're intolerant and you hate them, right? This is hate speech. If, if you preach against adultery, if you preach against sex outside of marriage, if you preach against these things, you hate, you're such a hater. You're intolerant. No, it's quite the opposite. We're not haters. We love. And because we love, we want people to come to salvation. All right? We want people to know that there is power in the Son of God through the blood of Jesus and their lives can change and they can have the hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ, which is what we call heaven. And we do it out of love. Before the world, it's hate speech, intolerant. You guys are homophobic there at Pueblo's Church. You believe that homosexuality is a sin, you're homophobic, right? Which means you're fear, uh, you have a fear of homosexuality. You believe that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. You don't think that Muslims will go to heaven? You don't think that this religion or that religion? You guys are Islamophobic or you're xenophobic, right? And so they use all of these terms to say, you guys there at Pueblo's Church, you are engaging in hate speech, This is the way they're going to attack, label the church, teachings, hate speech. I'll give you guys a good example. This, this stuff is already happening. All right. In, um, there's a, there was a famous radio program. There was a famous psychologist, Christian psychologist named Dr. James Dobson. Anybody here ever hear of Dr. James Dobson? All right. He had a famous program called Focus on the Family. And they emphasized in their teachings the family. And they had many testimonies of men and women who at one point practiced homosexuality, came to the knowledge of Jesus, repented, changed their lives. And this was an a, a, a international radio program. But when they would play those programs that dealt with homosexuality here in the United States, in Canada, they would have to put a totally different program because in Canada it was considered hate speech. And so it couldn't come out on the radio, right? Because the, the government owns the airwaves. Right. Hate speech. So, so this, this is already happening. 
how will they attack the church, right? Well, this is the famous canceled culture, right? Cancel culture, cancel, cancel them, right? You know, cancel culture. And what is cancel culture? It's a form of ostracism, right? Where we ostracize people, put them aside. Um, get, rather, it's online, social media, or in the world world, or both, and we kick them out of certain social circles or even business circles, right? The one such way of doing this is what they call doxing, right? And so doxing is, well, that Pastor Ruben, he's out there preaching against this and preaching against that. So they'll release online my, my address, my personal address, my personal cell phone number and where I bank and where I work, where my kids go to school. And before I know it, I have people calling me and harassing me and I have people in front of my house harassing me. And I have people at my workplace harassing me, right? And, and what have you. And this is happening. We see this happening to certain politicians on both sides. Um, this, this is happening to politicians where their personal information is being leaked out and they're getting harassed in their homes and their children are getting harassed. They're getting harassed in restaurants. The other way is boycott, right? Let's boycott them, you know? So, so you work at a business, we're gonna boycott your business, right? We're, we're gonna dox you, we're gonna boycott you, we're gonna cancel you. I'm not saying this is how it's gonna be, but I'm gonna give you guys a very real world example of how this could play out, how it could play out, right? Let's say Pueblo's Church banks with Wells Fargo. We don't, but let's just say that we did, all right? And um, I give a message on the sanctity of marriage, it's between a man and a woman, right? Or I give a message on life, right? Why we should be against abortion. Uh, some activists are mad and upset, Pastor Ruben taught, right? They find out we bank at Wells Fargo. They go to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, you guys are doing business with this church that preaches hate, hate speech. And that pastor there's a hater. Wells Fargo says, man, look, man, we're, we're not going to get involved in this political discourse. When I was there at city council and pastors were there protesting about um, men going into the women's bathrooms and, and, and shortly after we were on the radio in an interview and, and I said, look, we can protest all we want. We're really, we need to watch who we're voting for, right? So it's funny, all these pastors that protest it over there and then vote for someone to just sign a, a paper and open up the doors again, right? And different people went and spoke before city council. Some for men in women's restrooms and some against men in women's restrooms, right? Those who spoke for men in women's restrooms, they're heavy hitters. Saw certain politicians there. I'm not going to mention his name, but a very popular politician amongst Hispanic evangelicals speaking for men in the women's restrooms. I guess they've all forgotten. And representatives of big corporations. There was a representative of AT&T that spoke and said, hey, we believe this is the right thing to do is let these men in women's restrooms, right? So imagine, Wells Fargo says, we're not going to, get involved. Someone goes with the head of AT&T. AT&T comes to Wells Fargo and says, we have, ha AT&T is a billion dollar industry, right? Billion dollar corporation. They say, we have half a million dollars in, AT in Wells Fargo. If you continue doing business with those haters who preach hate speech, we're going to pull our money out. Wells Fargo is going to say, bye-bye. <laughs> Not to AT&T, to us. You don't think this is possible, let me tell you. This, this just currently happened to President Trump. This is a billionaire. They do that to a billionaire. Certain banks have closed doors on him. What do you think they can do to you? Right. So these are things that are playing out right now and that are gonna play out more and more against the church using the excuse of hate speech. Get them off Facebook, get them off Instagram, get them off this, get them off that, right, for engaging in hate speech, right? Hmm. Well, I know like we think about these things and man, it just sounds so doom and gloom, right? Oh, pastor, I came in so happy and that last song was so amazing and now you brought us all down. Well, I only brought you down to lift you up, right? Because I've got some really good news for you. 
The good news is that though we see the Antichrist is coming, that there are Antichrists, and the spirit of Antichrist is here, the good news is the king is returning. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, is returning. And all these things that we see around us shouldn't bring us down. The book of Revelations was not written to scare you or to put fear in your heart. The book of Revelation and times prophecies were written to encourage us because the king is coming. The king shall return. And this is a church that is encouraged and we hold on to the hope that the king is returning. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, we're in the last days, scoffers will come. In Spanish, it used the word burladores. Burla is people who will make fun of you. Right? Scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. Verse 4, how will they mock us? They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. So they're saying, hey, hey I thought you guys believed that Jesus is coming. I thought you said the king is coming. What happened? And they're they're going to mock us and make fun of us. It's already happening. I uh, like to listen to different preachers. There's a few preachers I like to listen to, and sometimes I'll, I'll just like binge listen to two or three teachings a day uh, for a week, just get ministered by, by men with great knowledge and wisdom of the Word of God. But I'll tell you guys something. I'm not just talking about Pueblo's church. I'm talking about church in general. Very rarely will you hear today in 2021 a teaching on the coming of the Lord. It's easier to preach about prosperity. It's easier to preach about healing. It's easier to preach about leadership principles. It's easier to preach about having a great life or your best life ever. It's easier to preach and teach about those things than it is about the return of the king. Why? Because we fall into the bullion of these mockers who ask what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. I thought he was coming. September 8, 1988. Ha! Thought he was coming with all those Left Behind series. Ha! Thought he was coming a couple of years ago when that crazy wacko, one of your own, prophesied that he would be coming on that certain date and didn't happen, right? So it's just kind of, you know, we don't need to talk about it too much. What happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? Okay. Verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Let me tell you, God existed before he created the heavens. God existed before he created the sun. God existed before he created the moon. That means that God existed before 24 hours a day existed. God existed before seven days a week existed. God existed before 12 months in a year existed. All right. Therefore, God doesn't move by the time that we are so concentrated on. When we say the king is returning, he is king over everything. He is king over the universe. He is king over this world. He is king over our lives. And he is king over time. So for him, a day, it's like a thousand years. And a thousand years, like mm, a day. And it's been 2,000 years since this was written. So for God, it's really been like two days. Now, I can't tell you if Jesus the king is returning today in five years, a hundred years, or in a thousand years from now. One thing I do know is that every day that passes, we are one day closer to his return. Every day that passes, we are one day closer to his return. And if 2,000 years ago, they were talking about the end days, the last hours, oh man, that alarm is about to set off, all right? That trumpet is about to blow. Those heavens are about to open. 
And the good news is the king is coming. The king is coming. Verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. Some people think he's late. He's late. He hasn't been gotten here yet. He's late. That's what some people think. No. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Why hasn't the king come? He's patient. He wants you to get right with him. Why hasn't the king come? For your sake. He's given you an opportunity to put your faith in him. Why hasn't the king come? Out of pure patience. Just waiting for you to preach the gospel, the good news to your family, letting them know, look around, crazy times, crazy world. Look at the spirit of the Antichrist moving all around us. That means that the king is about to come. Mom, dad, brother, sister, cousin, neighbor, BFF. You better get right with the Lord because as we all know, sooner or later, patience wears thin. Sooner or later, patience wears thin. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. And the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Let me tell you, how should we live while we wait for the return of the king? Live ready. Be ready. Be ready because this, this, this world is passing and we don't know when he's coming. You know, like there's some people at work, they only work when the boss is there. And then all of a sudden the boss shows up and catches them sitting around. And they're, oh, well, I just sat down right now. That's funny. This is the fifth time I've come unexpectedly. And all five times I come, you're always sitting around. Bye-bye. Right? But there's others. Rather, the boss is there or not there, man. They're just working. Because when the boss shows up, they want the boss to find them. What? Working. How should we live our lives as we wait for the coming of the king? Readily. Working. Verse 11 says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Live a holy and godly life. Amen. What is holy? Holy means to separate from the world. You know the things of the world, the desires, the pleasures of the world that pull us away from the Lord, pull us away from serving God with all of our heart? Get away from that. That's holy. Live a life that's godly. Live a life. I mean, your friends should not be surprised that you come to Pueblo's church. You, you shouldn't tell someone, hey, you want to go to church with me? And they're like, you go to church? <laughs> they, they should not be surprised you go to church. All right? Someone right now is calling you and you don't answer. And then you call them and you say, man, sorry, I couldn't answer. I, I, I was at church. And they're surprised. You go to church? Like, like, no, no. Live holy and godly lives. Because right? again, this world is passing. This world is passing. And many of us are more in love with this world than the creator of this world. Many of us are more in love with this world than we are with the creator of this world. Verse 12 says, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. Let me tell you, this world one day will be destroyed. This world will be destroyed. Oftentimes, you know, I marry a couple and uh, a couple of months later, I'll ask like, hey, when we're going to start having babies here? Right. And um, sometimes, you know, some couples are, oh, we're going to wait, you know, we travel or, you know, we're going to do this, that. And, you know, sometimes I'll tell them, like, you can go to the most beautiful places in the world. You can go to Paris, you can go to Alaska, you can go to Hawaii, you can go to Fiji, you can go to... Um, uh, Santorini, Greece, right? You know, go wherever you want. And none of it will compare to that first time you hold your baby in your arms. Amen. It's the most beautiful thing. Some of us, like we look at this world and we think like, like it's all about this world and the pleasures of this world. Let me tell you something. You can think of the most beautiful things your eyes have ever seen. And when you spend eternity with the king, you will see things much more beautiful. 
You can think about the most beautiful sound your ears have ever heard, the most beautiful thing your ears have ever heard. Let me tell you, when you spend eternity with the king, you will hear things much more beautiful. You, you can try and imagine what would be like, oh, if, if I had a, a billion dollars, if I had my private jet, if I had this, if I had my own island, you know, whatever. You try and imagine the most beautiful experience on this earth. Let me tell you, it will all burn away. It will all go away and it will not compare to the beautiful experience of spending eternity in the presence of your king. The king is coming. The king is coming. Why do we preach against homosexuality? Why do we preach against sex outside of marriage? Why do we preach against adultery? Why do we preach against drunkenness? Why do we preach against lying and gossiping? Why do we preach against um, uh, um, abortion and, and whatever else it is? It's because we want you to experience what we know we're going to experience. Heaven. Eternity in the presence of our Savior, the Lord and the King. Let's close our Bibles and let's bow our heads. Today's a good day. Can someone say amen? Today's a good day. Amen. It's a good day to put your faith in the King. You do not need to leave Pueblo's church or those listening online. You do not need to leave or live another day or another moment with the doubt. When the King comes, will he take me with him? Today, you can know for sure. You just need to make a decision to put your faith in the King. His name is Jesus Christ. And I want to invite everyone to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat out loud. Say, say Father God, I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that your Son, Jesus Christ, is Lord, King, of the universe, of this world, and of my life. And I believe with all of my heart, he gave up his life. He was arrested, he was scourged, crucified, died on the cross, and was buried. But three days later, you resurrected him. And because I confess and believe this, you promise me salvation. And with salvation, there are promises, promises such as believe in the Lord Jesus and you and all your house shall be saved. I believe in the Lord Jesus and I confess with my mouth what my eyes shall see, all of my house, all of my family, serving and worshiping the King in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise.